You're listening to Thursday Night AMP on the Angry Marks Podcast Network. And no, we are not at the Kansas Speedway, even though you hear cars racing by, but we are in the fast lane heading towards Backlash, or Payback, or whatever that stupid fucking show is called at the end of the month. Somebody tell me. Jason, what is it called? I don't know. <laughs> it's a raw show. I don't care. <laughs> okay, Abby, do you know what it's called? I think it might be Payback. I edited a story today about it. I think it's Payback. All right, so Backlash is the one next month. But they got me all fucking confused right now because I thought the Randy Orton versus Bray Wyatt match was taking place at one, and now it's taking place at the other. I think it's wow. taking place at Payback at the end of the month. April 30th is Payback, yes. Okay. Well, that segues us nicely into the topic of the Superstar Shake-Up because a whole bunch of people jumped brands, and I think Jason liked it more than I did. I loved it. Well, I was left kind of feeling meh about the whole thing. So, Abby, what was your take? I think it was kind of, I think it was okay. Um, I mean, it's it's WWE. How much can you really shake it up if you're not going to shake up what's going on backstage? Mm. Um, you know, with the writers and the management and everything. But I think it's good for what it was or what it is. To me, the only lasting impression that I have of it is that Raw seems to have gotten the short end of the stick, which is not usually how it works. Big time. Raw got shafted, and the beautiful thing is I'm going from not wanting to watch either show because there was no rhyme or reason who was on the roster to now wanting to watch SmackDown because you've got, got guys like Shinsuke Nakamura, you've got Kevin Owens, you've got Sami Zayn, you've got... Yeah, AJ Styles. AJ Stay Styles on. still there. In Charlotte. You've got Charlotte moving over, too, which is huge. That was my biggest takeaway from the Tuesday night shakeup was with Kevin Owens being on the show and Shinsuke already being on the show and AJ staying on the show. I suddenly have any possible combination of those three men in matches with each other to look forward to. So that alone makes SmackDown the winner. Mm -hmm. They're setting it up to be the wrestling show, which is good. It's, it's, It's just like the icing on the cake would have been if they had sent Cesaro and the revival over too, but you know, hey, pickers can't be choosers and SmackDown. SmackDown definitely got the better end of the deal. Well, they were never going to send the revival because the revival had just come they up. Had Anybody just come up? Yeah, they're not right. going to break up Cesaro and Sheamus either. No, and Nakamura was always going to be on SmackDown. They weren't going to switch him to Raw just after calling him up. So a lot of people seem confused about this this fact, and I had to keep saying no, no, no. Nakamura and The Revival and Ty Dillinger do not count as part of the shakeup. Quit lumping them in with it because they all debuted before the shakeup. They uh-huh. did, but they're, they're part of what wasn't there before WrestleMania, which which also helps. Also helping is, is well, Shinsuke had always said he wanted to go to SmackDown, but, but sort of the surprise was everyone was reporting that AJ Styles would likely be going to Raw, and he didn't, and it was great that he stayed on SmackDown. Yeah, that was the weird thing, was they released a video game update, and I don't remember which damn game. It's some trading card game. But they released trading card updates in the game that showed the colors changing. Like, they, they flipped the colors for AJ Styles and Charlotte Flair, which was supposedly the dead giveaway that they were switching brands. But only Charlotte made the jump. Yeah, and they I'm glad that. they kept AJ where he's at. Especially after he campaigned to stay there. It was a... Basically a huge baby face turn on his part. Mm-hmm. Which is kind of the opposite of what they did with Kevin Owens on Raw. <laughs> well, speaking of Kevin Owens, I really loved that he came out in a suit and tie with his beard shaved pretty much down to the stubble. It, it was nice to see a new presentation, but then have the same old cocky, arrogant, I'm the best champion on this brand. This is now the Kevin Owens show, and I am the representative of the Americas. Just it was great. Uh, he he got he got the pop turned into heel heat in in like five seconds flat. I know, and I love that about Kevin Owens. I love the fact that he can turn a crowd against him, no matter how much they want to love him. Which, ironically, just makes me love him that much more. I popped huge number one for him talking in French and then going, oh, wait, you guys only speak one language. And two, for him being in Boston and bringing up the Montreal Canadiens. That is pure (laughs) class. Pure 100% class, Kevin Owens. Good job. Well, 
I guess somebody took a cue from that whole two languages thing because then TJ Perkins later on on 205, or maybe it was one of the vignettes they showed, he cut the worst promo by trying to go all contraire mode prayer. And I was like, who scripted that for you? And fire Jeez. them. TJ, Mr. No Personality, TJ Perkins, it's like, yeah, if you want to, I'm sure he speaks Tagalog. You know, speak that. Speak Filipino, but don't try French. No. Or I don't know, I don't know what your forte is, TJ Perkins, but, yeah, maybe, or maybe that going terrible, back to fuck that owl would be your forte. Ter- terrible British accent he did was not any better either. I could picture Abby cringing. Yeah, anything TJP does, I pretty much cringe at, so... <laughs> The The only thing I like about it is that a heel turn can't be any worse for him because he was going nowhere. God, he's just, he's so, eh. (laughs) I mean, just. so mediocre. Yeah. Well, Jason, what were you going to say about speaking of? So I was going to say, speaking of 205 Live, it's another show that I'm kind of getting on board with now that I'm getting on board with SmackDown. I really like what they're doing with Akira Tozawa. I really like the psychological mind games and turning the table on Brian Kendrick. And it is just a thing of brilliance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, now Tozawa's- he's the one teaching the lessons instead of Kendrick. It is it is fun to watch. Tozawa, is, he's a phenomenal wrestler and... He's proven that he can be just gold on the mic, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's the one thing that did kind of get overlooked in this whole superstar shakeup is nobody ever mentioned, not that they really needed to, not that it was even important to, that 205 Live and Main Event and all these other tertiary shows on the network all have WWE rosters as well. And yet they were never brought up as, well, we're going to move these guys here. We're going to move these guys to, we're going to move these guys down the road to 205 Live, just like the traffic that went by. If there's one move that they should have made, it's that the Cruiserweight should be a part of SmackDown and not Raw. Because what sense does it have putting part of Raw on after SmackDown and having them travel with the SmackDown guys and then having to travel with the Raw guys when you can just have them be part of SmackDown? Oh, speaking of what doesn't make sense, why would they move Dean Ambrose to Raw and not Renee Young. Why? Because fuck you, that's why. It's almost like a slap in the face to the fact that they just got married. Like, hey, newlyweds, we're going to break you up. Enjoy. Either they didn't, they they legitimately didn't know or didn't realize they had gotten married, or um, they just didn't give a damn one way or the other. And neither one looks good. No. It it, it strikes me as the same kind of bullshit we saw when Rusev and Lana got married and they kept them out of the picture for a while just because, well, you ruined our plans for a storyline, so fuck you. Mm -hmm. And I really don't have any problem with the people who go to Raw because they're people I don't want to watch anyway. (laughs) I really really don't care about Dean Ambrose. I just don't. But that's why I'm annoyed that Miz and Maurice are now on this show. It's like, thank you for making a three-hour show even longer. Wow. What I really wanted. And Bray Wyatt. They're, they're, they've been wasting Bray Wyatt. It's like, fine. You try something new with him. Put him on Raw. It might work. I don't really care. It's not like I would tune in to watch Bray Wyatt anyway. They, they literally, and I mean this 100% of the truth, they literally do not know what they're doing with Bray Wyatt because they don't even know what a House of Horrors is. Oh, they know what they're doing with Bray Wyatt. They cut the legs out from under him every chance they get. I, They'd have to actually have a plan to get an axe to chop his legs. They don't even have that. They literally are flying by the seat of their pants. They don't know what they're doing. Yeah, fair enough. And this shocks people how? Oh, it doesn't shock me, but it's infuriating all the same. It just really encapsulated and put the the nice exclamation point on the trade on uh, the roster shakeup or whatever it was called. Elias Sampson showing up on Raw. That tells you everything you need to know about the superstar shakeup. And they didn't even, he just wandered out in the middle of the crowd during a women's match and they didn't even bother to mention it. He's the drifter. That's what he does. He drifted into the crowd and through the crowd and then drifted backstage and then drifted out on the stage and then drifted away again. Why can't he just drift off to unemployment? 
Well, he's the thing is, the guy's not bad in the ring at all. He's not bad. It's just the character is is not good. Not oh, good at all. That's the problem I have is I can't ever get into his wrestling because he annoys me so much I can't see past it. It's not heel heat. It's go the fuck away heat. Roman Reigns. Speaking of that, yeah, speaking of Roman Reigns, uh, that was like the best segment of Raw this week. <laughs> that Roman was a comedy. I, I don't know why people started a petition to complain about it because that was the funniest damn thing I've ever seen. Oh, really? There was that petition, and now there's the Fire Roman Reigns petition that came out today. That's the um, more logical petition based on the crowd response, because every time Braun attacked him, they popped. They got a, yeah, yeah, they they got a baby and, face pop. You know, a you deserve it chant when he's getting, you know, ragdolled around on a stretcher off a ramp, and, you know, <laughs> when they're announcing... Thing. Sorry, tipping, you know, when he's tipping the ambulance over, they're singing, you know, hey, 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 goodbye. But that, was, <laughs> that wasn't even the best part. He he comes back for the ambulance and he says, I'm not done with you yet. And you can hear the crowd go, yay. They were so happy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. And, and how people did not realize that was a jump cut in the middle of him throwing that stretcher off the ramp and moving the ambulance over on its side. Because, first of all, there was no way Roman was going to be on that thing when it went over the edge. And second of all, you can even see Roman's shadow as he jumped out of the back of the ambulance. People don't pay attention to stuff like that. How do they not? I mean, I'm not saying that I'm the world's foremost expert because I watch Mystery Science Theater 3000 or anything. But I've seen enough bad jump cuts to recognize even good ones. These are the same people, Stevie, who thought that Kenny Omega was going to show up at the Royal Rumble. You're, we're not yeah. working with much here. And there's a lot of them out there. Yeah, I was reminded of that in a response I got when I sent a tweet to Brian on Observer Live, because they immediately responded on the air with, oh, you think these people don't exist? Go to a house show. Yeah, and what was it back several years ago when they had the – when? McMahon got arrested on television or something. Oh, yeah, and people showed up at the police station trying to yeah, bail. Yeah, and it was like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> I don't oh. know if it, I mean, I don't remember this happening before, you know, back in like the Attitude Era and stuff. I don't remember it happening like when uh, uh, Mr. McMahon's amb- uh, limo blew up that one week. Well, actually, Donald Trump did call and ask them if, if Mr. McMahon was okay, so he apparently believed it. Yeah, but, you know, I, mean, I don't remember people coming out in droves and, you know, believe. I don't know if it's the advent of reality television. I don't know if it's just the fact that somewhere lately the, the, the master of the universe has let all the extra idiots out of the bag. <laughs> And they're overrunning us, and there's an uprising, like with The Walking Dead or something. I don't know, but it's just bad. I almost wonder if it's to the point where WWE has driven off the majority of their fans who ever had logic, reason, or sense, and these are the only ones that are left now. Oh, fuck. <laughs> yeah, we're screwed. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> that's, that's it. That, that's, like, that, that's pretty much The Walking Dead scenario. You know, we're... We're Rick Grimes and his band of, you know, Merry Men, and we're just surrounded, and there's no coming back. I I felt that way this week watching the responses to the things that were going on. And, and to segue it a little bit, the uproar over JBL now entering its second or third week and watching the responses fly back and forth on social media, including Kevin Nash weighing in today and saying, quote, unquote, don't be a bitch. And I'm thinking to fuck myself, him. yeah, that first of all, fuck him. But second of all, I really expected better than that from him. And he didn't even need to get into this. He could have stayed the hell out of it. Oh, well, see, now we're at the point where it's victim blaming time. And one of my favorite wrestling writers, Justin Labar. Uh, yeah, I'm saying that very sarcastically for anybody that's listening. <laughs> um, Spent all day, has spent all week this week kissing WWE's ass. And I would see him pop up in the comment section of some people's tweets. Um, 
like Braun Strowman and Lana and just being very, you know, complimentary and kiss ass to him. And then the victim shaming on Mauro Ronaldo comes out today. And it's like, oh, now it makes sense. You know, if you're going to do that, if you're going to kiss WWE's ass and be a wrestling writer, fine. That's your prerogative. Go for it. There are a million of them out there. But at least have the moral compass not to victim shame someone. You know, the most even-handed and best response I've actually heard to this the whole week was on live audio wrestling. Because they admitted they've worked with Morrow. They know Morrow. They're friends with Morrow. And Morrow is not always the saint. They, they were perfectly clear in pointing that out. Like, just because we know him and we're friendly with him doesn't mean that he's always the easiest guy to work with. And then they went on to point out that that doesn't mean you go in there with the purposeful mindset to set him off, spin him out, and make him even more manic or more depressive than he might ordinarily be. You don't go in there pushing buttons. No, and that's like today, I think it was on uh, Wrestling Observer Radio, when it was like, you know, Vince fell in love with Morrow's style of announcing, and they headhunted him and, you know, wanted him to come in and do this. And then once he got there, they fell out of love. And so maybe it was Morrow's fault to begin with, and that's why they did all this stuff with JBL. It was, you know, it's kind of victim shaming. It's It's kind of Morrow's fault if you really look at it. I'm like, no, it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. You don't do this kind of shit to anybody. The problem is really not JBL. He's just the visual representation of the problem. He is the, the figurehead of the toxic culture. No, the figurehead is Vince McMahon. Well, okay. It's just we've got his mouthpiece in JBL. That's true. And they are bosom buddies, so they're kind of interchangeable anyway. Yeah. And it's like... The problem really isn't JBL and his bullying all these years. The problem is, is that there's an environment there that, you know, breeds that and nurtures it and, and pretty much says it's okay. It's amazing that they want to because be this. Because it makes us laugh. Right. They want to be this billion dollar global powerhouse with a network with two million subscribers and distribution in over a hundred countries and WrestleMania gates that do twenty million dollars and they want to be big, 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 big and make movies and be super huge and yet they still have this nineteen fifties carny mentality when it comes to how they treat talent. Yeah, and it's all it's for one, boys will one be man's, boys. Yeah. Yeah, one man's sense of humor. His perverse sense of humor. Mm-hmm. It's like the whole we're well we'll we're 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 keeping Enzo and Cass in this role because Vince likes to see Enzo get ragdolled. Mm-hmm. Or if you want to go back further, it's like we're having Mae Young give birth to a hand that Mark Henry impregnated her with because Vince McMahon gets a good laugh out of making both of them look stupid. You know, and that's kinda of why it's like I don't nothing that they do surprises me anymore. But I just wish that some, that, I mean, the fact that this is getting mainstream attention, I wish to hell that WWE would do their normal shit and stand up and say, okay, you're fired. Just so it would be over with and go away. Yeah, it's not good. Because going if it was away. anybody else in any other situation, they'd have already been fired. Mm, they, they did. Would pro- already they, been they protected Mark Carano for a long time before they actually got rid of him. Yeah, but this is out in on pretty much every mainstream media site now and it has been for almost a week oh almost every site espn is espn hadn't touched it (laughs) and i don't know there's a coach basically quit because he refused to touch it yeah and there's a guy i follow on twitter and he knows somebody that works there and it's basically we're still researching it (laughs) we're not not doing anything but we're not going to put our name on something half-assed well, like, oh my God! I I don't he's been know. Posting I'll... screenshots of the text that he's getting, it's like, oh my God, seriously? I I think saying they're not going to do something half-assed is in itself half-assed because yeah. Morrow 
it, it's been very clear now, ever since Morrow didn't show up for that SmackDown three or four weeks ago when there was a blizzard, that there was something going on. And the mm-hmm. more time that went by and the more that people were saying things, it became apparent that he wasn't coming back. Mm-hmm. And it's not like he's just the WWE announcer. This is a professional sports broadcaster who calls Showtime Boxing and Mixed Martial Arts. He, it is a sports story. Yeah, but no, we're not going to, no, no, uh-uh. Well, we did kind of get away from the superstar shakeup there, but that was something we needed to address. And I want to go back to the superstar shakeup because of the tag team situation with Kofi Kingston being injured and the New Day moving to SmackDown. I don't know which brand is actually better or worse off for that. SmackDown. SmackDown got the They're job into the tag off. teams. They got they got the new day, but they also got the the shining stars. What the fuck? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but they're not the shining stars anymore. I don't think. They're still well, primo and epico. They still suck. They got the, U- the Usos are your champions. That should tell you how bad the tag team division on SmackDown is. See, and that is the one move that I absolutely would have made. I would have sent the Usos to Raw because they're dead in the water on SmackDown. And they seem more to fit that raw sports entertainment, big personality character type thing rather than, you know, work weight wrestler that SmackDown has. Well, they're actually work rate wrestlers if they're given a chance to actually wrestle, but we never see them. It's like if you took the Samoan SWAT team and you somehow excised the ferocity and excitement they have, you're left with the Usos. To me, the whole reason they're not exciting is because they were turned heel. They were exciting as baby faces. They floundered in this heel role. And you see it when they come on Talking Smack, and they're basically baby faces on that show, even though they're supposed to be heel characters. I thought they were born as whale shit when they were baby face. <laughs> well, you are entitled to that opinion. This is Angry Marks Podcast. You can call them boring as whale fucking shit if you want to. It's like I'm 11 years old. Face paint doesn't. It's like I'm older than 11 years old. Face paint doesn't do it for me anymore. You can even when call I was them. 11, the, yeah. the warrior did that, and it was like, oh cool. Sting did that, oh cool. But yeah, I'm adult now. Face paint doesn't make a wrestler. You can call them ambergris if you want to. <laughs> Futurama reference there. Yeah, or actually, Bob's Burgers. They did it too. Whale splork. Yeah, I wish they would book an angle with Futurama or Bob's Burgers on one of these shows. Oh, that would be something for, like, Kaiji Big Battle. They could have, like, a bender wrestler. <laughs> yeah, the gender bender. They actually did that. <laughs> I am a real puffy. <laughs> one of my all-time favorites. And they basically had to teach him that wrestling was a work. I was like, oh my god, every wrestling fan should watch this. It was a fun episode. Yes. Oh. Ah, Raw and SmackDown. You know, it would have been so much easier for me to swallow the Superstar shakeup if they had actually outlined some rules for it and said, the general managers will make drafts from each show, Each manager can protect one superstar that can't be traded from the men's and the women's division. They can also elect not to send a tag team. They can break up a tag team or send it as a whole. If they had just outlined some rules for this shit and actually explained why each move was being made, like Daniel Bryan has just drafted this team to SmackDown, they're leaving, and and so on and so forth, that would have been so much better. Sin Cara and Jigger Mahal have been drafted to the dumpster out back. <laughs> okay. Jinder yeah. Mahal needs to... I've, I've, I've already said what I want done to Jinder Mahal. Well, okay. For the yes. benefit of our listeners, enlighten them what you've like done to Jinder Mahal. Well, can we smash him in the face with a forearm the way he did to Finn Balor? That's one of the things I want done to him. Yeah. I just... I don't know. I mean, if, if people follow WWE on social media, you saw what happened to Finn when he had his return match against Gender. Came out looking like he'd been through a fucking meat grinder. And then today, I mean, on Monday on Raw, it was like, let's just knock his head off. Mm-hmm. Number one, I want the son of a bitch tested and then tested again. 
and then tested again, then sent over to Britain to be tested, then sent down to Antarctica to be tested, and then, then just sent whatever that truck plant. is going. Yeah, yeah, that truck can take him. Yeah, whatever's outside Jason's window to be tested, <laughs> and you know, and that's what I want for the most part because he is the most disgusting, disturbing-looking person on the roster, and there is no way in hell that is natural. None. He claims it's all his diet. Uh, nobody diets as yeah, hard as me. Right. Yeah, a diet of nothing but steroids. <laughs> well, maybe that's why it's such a hard diet. Maybe you, that's your problem, Ginger. Try eating actual food. <laughs> yeah, we're not talking your liquid diet. Um, <laughs> HDH and steroids. Just... This is not, you know, whatever, I don't know, it's not kill or be killed out there. No. You can make it look good without something like that. And somebody on Twitter said, well, maybe, you know, Finn's just not used to this. Dude. Uh, please, he came from New Japan. He's plenty used yeah. to looking. <laughs> and it's like, that That, that kind of reminds me that we're once again back to the whole Walking Dead thing, where people have no clue what the backgrounds of these men and women are anymore. They just don't fucking know. Um, it's like he spent eight years in New Japan and strong style is what they do. And none of them hurt him that bad. Right. I don't remember him looking like he came out of an episode of The Walking Dead after a match in New Japan. Only if he was no. selling to look like it. But even so, he didn't have all the bruises all over his face and he didn't have all the concussions. No, I mean, he had concussions, but not like that. No, not from just and still, one... maybe he hasn't announced that he's got a concussion or anything, but... But he didn't pass the impact concussion testing, so he's got it, whether they admit it or not. The doctors have not cleared him to wrestle. He could be out for months. Thanks, Jinder. Thanks a lot. They should have sent him to a dumpster. Don't send him to SmackDown. Send him somewhere to never return. Send him to fuck that owl. Mm. Even they don't deserve that. They deserve better than a guy that stiff and that, that uncapable of working. And the thing is, people are saying that he's good now. And man. Good at what? Injury yeah, he people, got, apparently. Yeah. He got good at it on the indies, and somebody pointed out nobody would book him while he was gone from WWE. His local now indie wouldn't even why. book him. How do you so get I, good when you're not working? How, how do exactly. you possibly? Well, you get good by sticking a needle in your ass and looking like Vince wants you to look. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you. Well, all those other people they brought back didn't come back looking like that. Kurt Hawkins didn't come back looking like that. I'm sorry, but every time I see Jinder Mahal, I literally, I mean, I feel nauseous. And I'm not, it's just one of those things where the human body is not supposed to look like that. He's got veins in places people should yes. not. No, it's, it's gross, it's nasty, it's disturbing. And Vince McMahon and Triple H and Kevin Dunn might find that attractive and think, that's what a man is supposed to look like. That's what a wrestler is supposed to look like. No, it's not. It's gross. It's it's horrid. Ironically, the perfect comparison to being fit and to being disturbing is the difference between Finn Balor and Jinder Mahal because Finn looks naturally ripped and athletic and lean and muscular, and Jinder just looks like a gross steroid binge. Mm-hmm. So on that pleasant topic... Maybe we should move on to New Japan since we've already Yay. referenced it. Although we've got some bad news, so it may not be so pleasant. Cause we've we got, got some talk about... good news, too, though. We had a match of the year candidate on this show. All right. Well, I guess let's start with the good news, then. Let's be happy for a minute. My God, what a main event. You we can had... say more than that. <laughs> we had, uh, see if any of you wanted to jump in, we had uh, Kazuchika Okada taking on Kassiori Shibata for the IWGP Heavyweight Championship match. This match went damn near 40 minutes, and Okada got his ass handed to him. Granted, he retained the title, but boy, did Shibata ever lay a beating on Okada. Well, that's the good news. And now, for Abby, the bad news. Uh, sorry, I had to sneeze. So I had to move you all for a second. Yes, the bad news coming out of this match is that it might have been Shibata's last match. Because he suffered a subdural hematoma. Which, if people do not know what a subdural hematoma is, it's bleeding on the brain. Um, 
Now, this is the story. The story is that he collapsed on his way to the back several times. And when he got to the back, he collapsed again and complained that he couldn't feel his right side. He was rushed to the hospital. Um, they diagnosed a subdural hematoma. They operated, which is something where they just do something like a burr hole to relieve the pressure. Right. Yeah. And Shibata was resting at the hospital. And his doctor, Tokyo Sports, and said that, um, you know, this kind of thing can reoccur. Um, it didn't necessarily happen during the match with Okada. It could have been there, and it could have just aggravated it now. Um, as for his future as a professional wrestler, extensive testing and monitoring will be required. And that the doctor, who is an actual well-named, well-known doctor in Tokyo, he's not optimistic about Shibata's future. Well, Dave Meltzer, who I've half agreed with and half not agreed with in the last week, you know, depending on the situation, came out and said, hey, it's a work. No, he said it could. Thought it was, he, he said it could be a work. No, he said he had been told it was a work. Well, and then he, he came back and said, "No, no, that's what he said to begin with. He had been told it was a work by some, by two people that worked there." But he was only told that by two people. He wasn't saying yeah. that was the truth. No, but that's he didn't clarify it at that time. Then he came back and said, "Well, it might not be a work. Now it appears not to be a work." So. But the whole prevalent they, theory, just why people want to know, if they want to know why it's believed it could be, is that Shibata needed some time off for other injuries, and this would be a cover for that. Yeah, That's the man the has been wrapped up like a fucking mummy since G1 last year. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, by God, he needed some time off. Yeah, he and certainly did. And the thing did. is, with it, if, I think the reason that people kind of got up in arms about the whole this injury is a work thing, it's not that we have a problem with injuries being worked into storylines or stuff. It's that, one, Japan's not well known for doing that, and they don't do that. Well, two, it would be after what happened to Tomoaki Hanma, you wouldn't really want to work something like that. You, you like to, you like stealing my thunder here. Sorry. I apologize. But, yeah. And you hear something like traumatic brain injury these days. That's not something you do a pro wrestling work with. No. Not when in the past you had people die and people kill their families and people just, you no, know, that's not something you work with. Mm. Not when you've had I legends think of fans Lucha are Libre. very, very sensitive about that. Yeah, when, when you've had people who've legitimately died in the ring during a Lucha Libre show in Mexico, mm-hmm. that's not something you make up as a storyline. No. You had a Japanese like, legend in Misawa die in the ring, too. That's true. Uh, and you had, you know, Hayabusa over there get paralyzed in the ring. Mm-hmm. That's why I said Japan doesn't really do this. They take it more seriously. And so I think that was where the initial thing came from. No, it's not a work because this would be harboring, you know, New Japan probably harboring a lot of ill will if it turned out it was. But I mean, I think fans got a little, little bit, and people were saying, "Oh, let it be a work." You know, that means Shibata's fine and everything. I think the whole thing is fine. Work us with a shoulder. Work us with a neck. Work us with a back. Work us with a hip. Don't work us with a traumatic brain injury. Not these days. No. That's just a line in good taste you probably should not ever yeah. cross. It, it doesn't hoove anything. It doesn't behoove them to do that. No, and I think especially with Western audiences, it's just one of those things where we were shook so bad by Chris Benoit that that kind of, that became the line of demarcation where this is the line you don't cross anymore. Mm-hmm. And you don't do it because a woman lost her life a little boy lost his life, and a man lost his life. You don't. This is something you don't do an angle with. I feel horrible for even having to point this out, but when you bring him up, one of the things that I actually used to like about him was consistent selling. When he had an injury in a match, he did not stop selling it before, during, after, even a week later, he would still be favoring an arm or a leg because of the last week's match. His psychology was second to none. Mm-hmm. But 
he left that lasting thing of, okay, head injuries are not something we fuck with. No. And, <sighs> you know, when you start talking death and you start talking brain stuff, it's like, it's not that fans don't appreciate being worked anymore, because I think we all appreciate when that line between reality and, and storyline is blurred to the point where we really don't know. But we got that on this not show too. with those set of circumstances. Not with things that could kill you or leave you paralyzed for the rest yeah. of your life. Don't do it with that. Well, somebody doesn't realize I'm on the air right now because I just got a phone call. It's Thursday night. Where the hell is she going to be? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thursday night AMP. It's kind of in the name. I Exactly. So let's talk about the rest of Soccer yeah, Genesis let's, let's, and move let's on. Let's talk about the work that did happen because a lot of us thought that there was a legitimate injury or a legitimate knockout in the match between Hiromu Takahashi and Kushida because it was for the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Championship. The thing went less than two minutes, one minute, 56 seconds, and Kushida's out like a light. And it was perfect. I'm not complaining. I don't want to see Kushida with the title. It was just, yeah, I I mean, didn't they, they worked as good. <laughs> they really did. They, yeah, and the thing is, I had left the room for just a second, and I heard it when I was out of the room. I was like, no, it's not over. And I come back in here, what the fuck? <laughs> I was out of the room. I blinked and I missed it. You think you're safe? It's the match has just started. You know, go get yourself a soda it's or something. Japan. You come back Nothing and... ever goes less than two minutes. That was Nothing yeah. Nothing goes was less than ten. <laughs> Especially for title matches. Even the junior heavyweight title for matches. That. And it was the semi main event. So yeah, they they worked us all. They worked they worked all of us on Twitter really well. But it was perfect. It was done perfectly. That was perfect. Another thing that was perfect was Zack Sabre Jr. trying to twist Hiroki Goto's digits off. I know. I still wanted Zack to, you know, I kept tweeting out, kill him, Zack, because I I don't like Goto. It, it, it's, not that it, it's not even that I don't like Goto. I just don't he's give just, shits about Goto. He's just not a good I'm, fit for New Japan. I'm completely indifferent towards the man. So anytime, you know, and speaking of Goto, he was on the... um. Rev Pro card, the Epic Encounter card today in London. And the fans there were cheering, fuck, you know, the British fans. He was in the ring with Zach Gibson. Fuck him up, Godot, fuck him up. Yeah. And it's like Godot didn't know how to react. He's like, huh? <laughs> These people are cheering for me. What? <laughs> you know, it's like, because I don't think he was used to, you know, getting that kind of reaction from the fans. And the fans were not used to hearing that. It's like, I was even confused. What? Kato got a face pop. Wow. He did end up I think it was more title, along was... the lines of, I think it was more along the lines, they wanted Zach Gibson killed, not really rooting for Goto, but. He was a means to an end. Yes. And he did end up retaining his title, but again, he took a nice beating from Zack Sabre Jr. in the process. And now we'll get Misu and Goto, which kind of makes a little bit more sense to me. And hopefully we'll see some beautiful murder there. Yes, I'm all for that. Misu decided to to show up afterwards and try to beat on Gato, but for the most part, the young lions and staff kept them separated. But yeah, the the shocker for me was War Machine actually winning the IWGP Heavyweight Tag Titles. That was great. I'm so glad War Machine is over there, and I don't like them in Ring of Honor. I never really did. Love them in New Japan. I agree with you 100% on there. I wasn't a fan of theirs in New Japan. I really didn't see this new team, barely new to New Japan anyway, taking the titles off of an established team like Tenkozy. I don't have a problem with it. It just shocked me. And the match was really good, too. So, In fact, I don't think there was a bad match on the card. What about the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Tag Match? Well, hell, anything with Tai Chi in it is god-fucking-awful, but... <laughs> hate Tai Chi. <laughs> Everybody hates Tai Chi. Yes. Tai Chi hate brings the world together. It was a fun show, though. I enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to um, the one I can't pronounce, which I think is next weekend. Don Taku? Oh, Don Taku. No, Don Taku okay. I can pronounce. It's the toy. I can't pronounce it. Toya. Oh, the one that looks like Tokyo Moon. Yeah, that one. <laughs> I think they'll be really good shows. It should be good, but yeah, check definitely if you haven't watched it, check out the main event from Sakura Genesis. Yes, that was great. And Five that stars. Crazy, 
pray for Shibata's health afterward. Yes. Because Shibata became, if he wasn't already a star, he became a star in that match. And it did get five stars, luckily. So uh, He was a star for me long, long before oh, that. Oh, yeah, definitely. But it was nice. You know, somebody said, well, there are more important things than one man's opinion. I said, I know, but it was nice that this match got five stars because it earned it. Mm-hmm. Which reminds me, Jason, I haven't heard anybody complaining about our star ratings for WrestleMania, so I think you and I must have been on the mark. We disagreed on some things, but yeah, it's like I, some of the matches deserve negative two stars, and some of them deserve three, some of them deserve four. It was a mixed bag. Mm-hmm. But it certainly wasn't the worst WrestleMania ever. Oh, it, we did. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't anywhere near as bad as WrestleMania 32. But we didn't get Abby's opinion last week, so I want to get hers right now on how she felt about it overall. Overall, it wasn't bad. It wasn't great, but it wasn't bad. It, it, it wasn't as bad as last year's. Not not nearly the dumpster fire last year's was. The the one thing they both had in common was being way too long. Other than that, different shows. Yeah. This, this WrestleMania weekend for me was tough because I was trying to watch 97 things and cover them all at the same time. <laughs> And it was like, I mean, I had stuff going on my, at one point I had stuff going on my phone, on my tablet, on my laptop, and on the television. That's where, you know, I was trying to do four shows at once that were overlapping like that. And it was like, I can't do this. <laughs> it just got to be too much WrestleMania weekend. I I actually learned my lesson from that about seven or eight years ago when I tried to find writers on the site to cover each what I considered each major show of the weekend. Like I wanted somebody to cover Dragon Gate and I wanted somebody to cover Ring of Honor and I wanted somebody to cover this and I wanted somebody to cover that. And nobody volunteered and I ended up doing all the shit myself. And that was the weekend where I finally decided, no, I'm not doing yeah. this anymore. It's, yeah. That kind of burned me out big time. WrestleMania yeah. weekend. And um, I didn't want to do it, but yeah, I, I think come 2018, you won't be doing near so much. No, I will not be. <laughs> I mean, I'll watch it, but I will not be covering it. Because uh, I think I watched uh, about 30, almost 40 hours of live wrestling from Friday through Tuesday. And that was a little bit too much. Mm-hmm. And no, uh, WrestleMania was by far not even the best show of the weekend. So. Yeah, you kind of echo the sentiments I had. It, to me, it felt like a seven-hour episode of Raw. <laughs> Aside from no, Raw, no, showing up, it's no. like a seven-hour episode of Raw. That's that's too low. It was better than an episode of Raw. It, it had was, its it raw elements, of Raw, but but it didn't feel like the biggest show of the year to me. That WrestleMania is your biggest show of the year. Aside from the Hardy Boys showing up, it didn't feel like it was the biggest show of the year. What I'm wondering now, with a couple of weeks' perspective, is why people are debating. Whether or not Undertaker retiring is legit or not, I I didn't have any question when I saw the end of that match and I saw him lay everything down. And yet now people are going back and forth about it, saying, "Well, he didn't say he was retired." Like Undertaker needs to come out and actually physically say, "I retire," before you'll actually believe it. Stevie petitioned to get Braun Strowman fired. Okay, I know. We're back to that same okay. point again. Yes, you're right. We're dealing with the walking dead here. So, How about a petition to get Braun Strowman promoted? <laughs> I think that's the one to get Roman Reigns fired. That, yeah, yeah, that too. <laughs> they kind of go hand in hand with each other. Yeah. to have Braun Strowman tip over more ambulances with Roman Reigns in them. I did like the, I believe the website's name was Bar Bent. Their article on it about how Sure, he could have tipped that ambulance over by himself if gravity didn't exist. <laughs> yeah. Quit I taking guess. it so literally, you morons. Just stop. What does it they say on the Mystery Science Theater intro? You should say to yourself, just relax, it's just a show. <laughs> yeah, just repeat to yourself, it's just a show. I should really just relax. There you go. That's what they need to do. It's a show. It's entertainment. I mean, yeah, cars don't really explode and flip over in blockbuster movies, but you watch those and you don't bitch about it. 
Did you? Uh, I know we're getting on a tangent here, but did you ever see the MythBusters episode where they tried to recreate that? Yes, I've seen every MythBusters episode. That they're, I'm a huge <laughs> fan of the show, and yes, that that came immediately to mind where they had to use a hydraulic cannon basically to get the car to flip. Exactly, or or when they had to fill it up with gasoline just so they could ignite something when it went over the cliff because it wasn't going to blow up on its own. Yeah, gas tanks just don't explode when you shoot them with a bullet. No. Ah, yeah, that people need to look at WWE the same way. They call it sports entertainment for a reason. Let's focus on the entertainment part. They're putting on a show for you. I think it, it, it confuses us, though, when it actually is entertaining, because we don't quite know what to think anymore. <laughs> uh, I think it yeah. just flips a switch with some of us. It's like, wait, whoa, something's wrong here. Ah. <laughs> uh. Well, I'm trying to think of what we should talk about from the news, because we've already talked about Sakura Genesis and the Superstar Shake-Up, and that was pretty much my list. That and JBL, and we already talked about that. Ambrose and Renee getting married, which, you know, no, Dean was not tricked, and no, Renee is not the Antichrist. Okay, again, what kind of people are you? Everybody just calm down. The the Walking Dead, the the Mindless Hordes, yeah, I'm going to throw that one right back on you for anybody who actually thought either of those things. Dean Ambrose fangirls are some vicious, nasty people. Yeah, I saw some things said about Renee Young I never wanted to read. Uh Uh-huh. That she was thinking, I could go back to doing After Buzz and not deal with this. Might be the best for her. Just stay out there in Las Vegas with Blue and enjoy the desert and maybe stay out of the desert because that's where they had bodies. But still, just mm-hmm. don't even deal with the crazy people. Yeah. You know, I hear Arizona is really nice this time of year. They could just move there and just not even be in Vegas and not ever see anybody. I don't know of much more news that came out this week. I can't there remember. Was... I've kind of been on a self-imposed exile for the last couple of days because I've been yeah. fed up with stuff. There's a take I wanted to get from you, Abby, that we were we were talking about it, and I was talking about how I wasn't the biggest Undertaker fan, but I know you're a bigger Undertaker fan than I was. What was the impact of Undertaker retiring for you? How was it to watch that? What were your opinions on the Undertaker retiring on his career, that whole spiel? I think they could have done it differently. I think they could have done it better. I said at the time that <clears throat> the whole match probably never should have happened the way it did. It never should have been booked like that. Taker, nobody looked good in that match. I think it could have been done a lot differently and could have been done a lot better. I think it 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 was bad for everybody involved. No argument here. Because it it didn't look good. And it wasn't that it didn't look good like Roman just dominated him and, you know, put him down. That wasn't, it wasn't that, it, it just didn't look good. And I think Jason and I disagreed on it because I felt like, sure, it was clunky in places, and sure, Undertaker is too old to really work a good match with all the injuries he has, but I allowed myself to invest a little more in the psychology than the physical nature of it, and because I knew the importance of it, and that it was probably going to be Undertaker's last match ever, and I was listening to Jim Ross call Undertaker's last match ever, it it worked for me. I was able to suspend this belief to that point where I enjoyed it. I mean, I didn't hate it, but I just thought it was very sad in it how it was done and executed well, and how it was, was pulled off by everybody. I just thought it was very, very sad but it because was also, it could have been done a lot better. But it was also literally sad because my wife was moved to tears at the end. She knew that this was a girl who grew up with Undertaker from her earliest days, and now she's like, I'm never going to see him again. She was genuinely upset. Oh, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people were, but I'm just talking the match as it was done. It didn't do anybody any favors. It wasn't what WWE wanted it to be. Yeah, it was clunky in spots, especially that that attempted tombstone that uh, Roman tried to do on Taker was just atrocious and just... Everything Undertaker had, it was just like, okay, Roman's going to get out of it and then hit him with a Superman punch. Yay. If they really wanted it to be meaningful, they should have just let him retire when Brock Lesnar became the one in 21 and one. Then then it could have been done right then and there. Graceful exit. Agreed. 
I just think that match didn't do anybody any favors. It They're never going to turn Roman Hill at this point. So, you know, it didn't do him any favors. It just made him look bad. <laughs> it made I, people I, hate him even, even more. It made people hate the bookers and the writers even more. It made people hate Vince even more. That, that's why you know, it, it took some of the luster off of The Undertaker. So that's why I said it was just, it shouldn't have been done the way it was done. It was bad for everybody involved. And, and I'm not laughing because I disagree with you. I'm laughing because of this idea that Roman Reigns is going to be a baby face forever because he, it, the, the harder and harder and harder they try to push it, the bigger and bigger and bigger the negative reactions get. It is... It is just absolutely fun now to watch people just totally shit on him because, oh, yeah. because they don't get it and they're not going to give up. And it's not Roman's fault. And it's getting to the point where people with two brain cells to rub together. Yeah, it's funny and it's ridiculous and it's absurd, but you can't help but kind of feel sorry for the guy. Yeah, I until you bad. hear him open his mouth. And then it's like, you dumb fuck, shut up. Just don't say anything. Right, but yeah, I I feel bad for how poorly he's cast in the role that he's in right yeah. now. And they have the lesson right there in front of them. If they would look back to the 1990s in their own recent history, if you just let the guy turn heel, he would get over as a face and you could turn him back. It would be so easy to do. Die, Rocky, die. Exactly, that's all it takes if you just... Let the crowd show you which way they want to go. You can get the guy to where you want him to be. But, no, they're not going to do that. Vince is like a dog with a bone, so. And that is the one thing I don't understand is he used to be smarter than that. He, he used to have more of a clue than that. I think it was really good last week on Raw when he came out and the fans threw at him, Roman sucks. That was the post-mania one where they, where they booed him for 10 straight minutes before yeah. he said a word. And, and then when Vince beautiful. came out to, you know, Vince came out to announce Kurt Angle and mm -hmm. the fans started chanting Roman sucks at him like, we're letting you know, and hey, this is Roman, how we yeah. feel. <laughs> I kind of think, think, really think that's the reason why we don't see Vince on TV very much anymore is he doesn't want to. Yeah, he can't care. take it. Yeah, he can't take it anymore. And now he's just one of those stubborn old men. You know, old man yells at Cloud, you know, and probably he's back there in Gorilla screaming at everybody, get off my lawn. But, <laughs> you know, still, I just don't think these days he can take it. So he's not as flexible as he used to be. And he's just stubborn. That might also literally be true when it comes to his workout regimen. He might not be as flexible as he used to be. Oh, Lord. <laughs> But well, you've also got people like Triple H saying that, oh, well, well, Roman Reigns is a heel because you're booing him. And it's like, no, no, stop trying no. to toe the company line. He's not a heel. He's got something that is now beyond X-Pac heat. He's got, he's got Roman Reigns heat. In fact, I'm not going to call him Roman Reigns anymore. He is, he is Luther Reigns. <laughs> I encourage everybody out there to just start chanting Luther, Luther, Luther. Anytime Roman Reigns comes out, just chant Luther. See, no, I, I'm going to disagree with you because I'm probably the only person, me and my friend Chad, who used to go by Abismo Blanco on this website, but he and I may be the only two horseshoe fans there ever were, but we both liked Luther Reigns. Well, that's on y'all. <laughs> Abby, I mean, what what's your thoughts on Luther Reigns? <laughs> Lord have mercy. See, it was great for us because we went to a SmackDown show before he was even announced as being in back in you know wrestling again because he'd been off TV for a while and he hadn't been with WWE. And then this guy came out with the the U shaped shaved haircut, and I'm like, oh my god, is that? And Chad sitting next to me started barking out. He's like, yeah, it's horseshoe. And so we got our whole section to start chanting. Horseshoe, horseshoe, horseshoe. Oh, goodness. And that was before he was even a character on SmackDown. That was even before he was in the cabinet and Kurt Angle and all the other things he did. Man, I saw a lot of debuts back in the day going to those house shows. That, so, somebody pointed out to me, you know, you should go to the house shows and see what those marks are like. 
Well, yeah, I do kind of miss going to those house shows because that was when they would debut, quietly debut a lot of people that they were going to put on TV later. That was before we had NXT to bring people up. They would debut them on the house shows. Well, that kind of hits on a point that I had wanted to hit on with WWE and secondary titles, if you don't mind shifting gears for a moment here. No, go ahead. With the situation you have on SmackDown now, with with guys like uh, Sami Zayn, Kevin Owens, and AJ Styles all feuding over the U.S. title, and with uh, Brock Lesnar being a part-timer and holding the Universal title, it seems to be getting to the point now where you have the U.S. title kind of taking precedence over the world title on SmackDown and the Intercontinental title being defended more often on Raw. It's almost like the secondary titles are moving to the forefront and the big titles, so to speak, are an afterthought. I think Kevin Owens very succinctly made that point at the opening of SmackDown. I think that's what he was getting across was, hey, you know what? You want a champion? I'm your champion. I'm the one who will be here every week. But it's, it's like that on both shows. It, it, does anybody really care that Randy Orton has the supposed big belt? No, the buzz is around Kevin Owens. is probably going to be... Hopefully he retains. Hopefully it's not Chris Jericho right before he goes on tour with Fozzie coming to SmackDown Live. But but yeah, Jer- er, uh, Kevin Owens versus AJ Styles for the U.S. title is going to be much more interesting than the world title between Randy Orton and Bray Wyatt, who's not even on SmackDown anymore. Yeah, Randy Orton and Brock Lesnar are, for all intents and purposes, afterthoughts in the title picture. You never thought you'd say that, but they're actually less important with world titles than they would be without. And you can kind of get into that situation like you had in ECW back in the day where a guy like Rob Van Dam and a guy like Kevin Owens here can bring instant credibility to a second title, and it can be right on par with or even better than the company's alleged top title. Yeah. Yeah, Rob Van Dam's run as the TV champion was great because he would come out every week and point out, I'm the real champion. I'm I'm Mr. Whatever Night of the show it was, you know. He'd, he'd be Mr. Whatever Night that show was on every week. Mr. Monday Night, Mr. Sunday Night, Mr. Thursday Night. But he was that night. He was the guy you would tune in to see. And that's what it's going to be on tonight. I mean, it's going to be interesting to see it because you, you were starting to see that on Raw with Kevin Owens just because he was there and defending the belt more often. But, yeah, then Goldberg, the part-timer. But, yeah, I mean, that... that Hellboy jerky title has just been a clusterfuck since <laughs> since the go, unfortunately, with Finn Balor getting injured. But it, you're, it, it's like you're going to see it here. You're, you're, we're seeing the, the secondary titles getting elevated, and it's 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 interesting. It's, it's almost like like your TV titles, your ones that are defended on your TV shows, and then your big belts that are only defended at pay per views. I actually have no problem with that. If they made the U.S. and the Intercontinental title the focus of television on a week to week basis. And then once every two or three months, we had the big world title match that might actually make the world title matches mean more. I would have no problem with that. It would be able to placate Vince that, you know, the big hosses are getting their, their big titles in and the focus would be on the, the wrestling guys and the alleged secondary titles. Well, Abby, what's your opinion on this? I hate Brock Lesnar. (laughs) 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 I don't think that, I mean, I don't think that your main champion should be a part-time guy. I just, I don't. I think it's ridiculous. And I don't know. I just, I wish that they, I wish they would do things differently, but I know that they won't. So I kind of just get my wrestling feel from British stuff and Japanese stuff and tune into WWE because I have to. That's just kind of how it is. I take it for what it is and that's it. Fair enough. Well, speaking of British wrestling, I saw an interesting tidbit in the news that we haven't addressed, and that's why Jim Ross turned down the ITV World of Sport deal. Apparently, they were only going to tape a 10-episode season, and they were offering really good money, and it was an attractive offer for 10 episodes, but JR looked at a two-year commitment from WWE versus a 10-episode commitment from ITV, and he decided that WWE was dealing the better hand. Mm-hmm. And would Jim Ross age, have been calling that live? Would he have had to travel to the UK to call that each each of those ten episodes, or is that something he would have done in post production from home? I have a feeling they would have done it like New Japan, and he would have done it in post. Okay. But even so, I can see him at his age and his point in life where he is right now thinking. I want long-term deals. I want guarantees. I don't want something that'll go away. 
you know. So you can't blame him for making that call. Yeah, and plus, I don't think I would want to be involved in a venture that had Impact Wrestling's stench anywhere around it. <laughs> you bring up a good point. I don't know. With the events of the last seven to ten days, I wouldn't say that Impact Wrestling is suddenly a shining beacon of hope. I would never give anybody any delusion of that. But I'm starting to feel like I do need a little bit more of an alternative besides just New Japan. It would be nice to look at it on my DVR and fast forward through the bad parts and maybe find some nuggets of gold in there somewhere. Well, don't they have Victory Road coming up? Yeah, in fact, that's tomorrow night. Does anybody care? Uh, The people, the 5,000 people who pay $9.99 for it, like Mike Poulin. Is that the numbers that it does, 5,000? It's sub-10. I don't know the exact number, but it's not big enough to even be like, you know how they used to rate pay-per-views on like a 1.0 scale where it was like one household Mm -hmm. out of every hundred in America bought this pay-per-view? They're they're not even 0.01. They're below that. And this this isn't even live. It's, it's these these were matches that have been pre-taped. Yeah, they call these evergreen shows because they tape them and then they just air them whenever. Yeah, it's like when you can go to Wikipedia and look up the results with at, at, at a company that's doing as poorly as Impact is doing, and they're charging money for a show. You can already see the results. Not the best business model. No, but. I'll be honest about it. If I had more money than I do, which is not much, and I had more time than I do, which is not much, I probably would spend 10 bucks on a wrestling pay-per-view because that's not a lot to ask to watch a couple hours of wrestling. I'd probably give that money to Flow Slam or DDT Universe first, to be honest. Right, but Flow Slam is a $20 investment every month, whereas TNA is like $10 one time every couple of months. Flow Slam was worth it WrestleMania weekend. They not, say, like not saying they were on their network. I got it for like WrestleMania weekend. I've got it through. I think the end of the month. And yes, I'm I'm looking forward to the OTT show this weekend from Ireland. Oh yeah. Well, why don't we go ahead and talk about that? I don't have the card in front of me. Why do you do that? I don't have the card. In front of me. <laughs> you brought it up. I didn't bring it up. <laughs> you brought up Flow Slam. I was just adding. I, it. I didn't bring up Flow Slam. I just said it was a value of ten dollars versus twenty. That's all I said. I wasn't trying to go there. Well, fine. Forget we said anything about Flow Slam at all. <laughs> well, let's see if we can find this OTT card. It's got to be up here on the internet somewhere. While we're looking that up, let me just say, fuck that, Al. <laughs> I think Kevin has been watching it in his hotel room. No, I just really like saying fuck that owl. <laughs> I think we all like saying fuck that owl. Ruby Hardy, she did very good with that. Although, I gotta say, I gotta give props to a former guest on the Angry Marks Podcast Network, Congo Kong, making his debut tonight on TNA Impact. I'm not saying TNA Impact is worth a shit for watching, but, uh, you know... Maybe check it out for a few minutes to to watch uh, Congo Kong make his debut. See, that's one of the reasons I actually can get behind it is one of those guys that have been on either Undisputed Wrestling Show or the Nerdcast or our very own Thursday Night AMP are now actually being used on Impact Wrestling. So I feel like that's a boon to us that, hey, look at these guys we talked to. Now they're actually working on television, even if it is a subpar product compared to other things, at least they're getting that work. Yeah, I mean, guys got to make their money, right? Mm-hmm. And I, I, I will I will gladly quote Brutal Bob Evans, who I've, I've started to develop a great relationship with online. Don't get romantic about how you make your money in this business. Well, if you're getting to be that point where you have a good relationship with Brutal Bob, please invite him onto this show because... That is a man I would dearly love to talk to and interview and get his insight into the wrestling business. I don't know if he's really got time (laughs) to do that anymore. I mean, his his career has actually kicked into to overdrive. Um, He's actually in a place in the business where he's now doing his literally doing his dream job, which is traveling around everywhere, being able to work with new guys, being able to work with established guys. And to, to teach them the business on the inside and the outside and, and everywhere. I tell you what, go find Bob Evans on Facebook. 
no, not the restaurant, the wrestler, go find him and start watching his video series, um, Driving with Bob. Every morning, wherever he's driving, he's on Facebook Live for 15, 20, 30 minutes, just dropping knowledge and just laying down a path to success, whether you're a new wrestler, whether you're an experienced wrestler, or you're just a fan who kind of wants an inside view of what's going on. He dishes it out every day, and it's gr- it's always great. It's entertaining. Right on. Well, I think I've got the OTT card on FlowSlam.tv. Let me see if... Oh, no, it's trying to make me sign up. I thought it would just actually show me the card. But it does begin at 1.30 Central Time on April 15th. I got that far. Yeah, I'm on the OTTWrestling.com site. It doesn't have a listing of the matches, but it says who's going to be there. Mm-hmm. Okay, now I've got Eventbrite.ie. Let's see if that's helpful. Set to appear, Jay White, Grado, Will Ospreay, Ricochet, Bullet Club, Young Bucks, and Kenny Omega. But it doesn't list actual matches. It just says they're all appearing. That's what OTT Wrestling's site says, too. Why is it so hard to find this card? I went to Top Rope Press first. I'll have you all know. That was the <laughs> first place I went to look. Scrapper Mania 3, a YouTube video. No, that's probably not going to help. A uh, huge main event announced for Scrapper Mania 3 in April. Let me see what that is. Ryan Smile, Ricochet, and Will Ospreay versus the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega. That should be good. Yeah, that is your OTT main event, as far as I can tell. Abby can correct me if I'm wrong. Or she might still be looking for the card, because she's silent right now. The six-man tag might be the main event, or it could be the OTT Tag Championship six-man tag team match. And who's the Kings of the North versus the Lads from the Flats. Okay. Um, But, yes, we have – well, hell, I just – I hate my phone. (laughs) Damn. (laughs) Um, We have Grado versus Charlie Sterling. We have Marty Skrull versus Jay White, which should be really good. Uh huh. I've got the card now. I can follow along. Go on. Yes, today on the Rev Pro Show, it was Marty Scroll and um, Hiromu Takahashi, which I cannot wait to see this match when Rev Pro puts it up on Saturday. Mm-hmm. Because Hiromu molested Marty's umbrella. <laughs> he licked it. Now, now who he are the, the damn g- umbrella? Who are the gymnasties? Because I like that name. I have no clue. I don't. I don't watch OTT. I'm just. I'm just <laughs> now starting to get into this promotion. So this is a new one for me. Mm-hmm. You know, I went through, I, I did the progress thing, and then I went the Rev Pro way, then I did the ICW thing. Now I'm kind of getting into OTT, and you know, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm I'm expanding my my, my British Graps promotion list here. So OTT is next on my list. Well, now is a good time to do it because I saw Live Audio Wrestling just debuted a brand new show called British Audio Wrestling. So that's now getting extended coverage, and I'm probably going to hear about. This very card we're trying to talk about when I go listen to that show. Yes, there is a six woman tag team match with um, Team Warrior, which is OTT Women's Champion Katie Harvey, Jenny, and B Priestley. If you haven't seen Jenny wrestle before, look her up on the progress stuff. She's really good. B Priestley is just a badass. And they're and facing Martina, Nixon Newell, and Alex Windsor. Yeah, and if you haven't seen Alex Winter, she's really good. Nixon Newell is very good. And Martina, the Session Moth, I've heard really good things about, but I haven't seen her in the ring yet. So this will be my first time seeing her. The Session Moth. I hope she's not confused with that moth, uh, Marty the Moth Martinez from Lucha Underground. <laughs> no, not even close. <laughs> good, good. Yes, and then the the Elite match with that – um. Ricochet this, was supposed to be in originally, but he's injured, we think. Mm-hmm. Kind of, sort of, maybe. So. Yeah, or yeah. he's going to NXT, one or the other. I think he's actually hurt. Since he's a New Japan champion now, I don't think he's going to be going to NXT anytime soon. Every now and then I keep hearing speculation about it, but yeah, you're right. Yeah, but plus, you know, he's still locked into that Lucha Underground contract. He can't go anywhere yet. <laughs> Unless they stop filming, at which point the contract... Probably becomes null and void. Yeah, but right now that's really not an issue, so. 
But yes, we've also got Jigsaw versus Scotty Davis, Grado versus Charlie Sterling, and Jern Simmons in action, but not listed. Oh, not listed up. You have to moment. see Jern. You have to see him. This is the one man in professional wrestling who I do not mind doing a 45 minute entrance with an air guitar. <laughs> <laughs> So you're I comfortable do not with, mind at you're all. You're comfortable with Jern not even having an opponent. You're just I don't give that. a shit. No, just just have him come out, do the air guitar thing on the stage. I'm 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 good with it. See, I kind of feel that same way about the guy from the UK Championship who was a bartender. Like that guy could just come out and do nothing, and I'd be happy just to see him. Why is the name eluding me right now? If you haven't seen Jern Simmons, go out of your way to look some of his stuff up. His entrance alone is great. I mean, the man is is really, really good. But, yeah, go out of your way to look him up because the entrance alone is worth the price of admission. All right. It's actually going to bug me now until I look up the name Who of are that. you talking about? The guy from Scotland. Wolfgang? Yeah. The one who wanted to drink a beer with everybody. Wolfie, yeah. Yeah. Wolfgang Young. He didn't even have to wrestle. Not that he wasn't great wrestling, but just listening to him cut promos, I was like, fuck yeah, I'd party with you. This is why you need to watch ICW. He's he's the former ICW champion. He's really good. Yeah, I should. You're right. I would watch any show that Wolfgang was on just because Wolfgang was on it. That's yes, how he over really he got good. with me. Ah, so, what else do we have to talk about or plug? Or do we just go ahead and Call it a night at this point. Since I'm slowly losing the ability to form sentences cohesively because I'm so sleepy, probably we just need to go to cheap plugs and call it a night. All right. Well, Abby, Top Rope Press, and what else? I will plug Angry Marks. I will plug, um, let's see, Progress, Rev Pro, and ICW On Demand since we've been talking about them. They are less than WWE Network. They run about... Between six fifty and seven eight dollars a month for their pivot share stuff. Um, New Japan Pro Wrestling, the best nine hundred nine ninety, and you can spend every month. Very good, very good. Always, always, always very good. And you can find me on Twitter at Abby A. All right, Jason, what do you have to plug? I'll plug myself on Twitter at Great Sudoku and JPW World. As Abby said, the best nine hundred ninety nine yen you can spend a month. And don't forget about NJPW1972.com, the NJPW English site. All right. Well, if it's not too egotistical, I'm going to plug me because I've done five interviews this week with various stars of mixed martial arts. So I want you all to check out MMAmania.com 